ready for the word? John chapter 11, not Luke. John chapter 11. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Verse 34, John 11, 34. And he said, where have you laid him? Jesus said, where have you laid him? They were talking about Lazarus. Where have you laid Lazarus? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Then the next verse says that Jesus wept. Jesus cried. Oh. Our Lord was moved. He cried. He wept. Look at, what the, look at the next verse. The Jews said, then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. The love that Jesus had for Lazarus was known by all. The day they were coming to tell Jesus about Lazarus' sickness, they told him, that's in... Um, Verse 1, John 11, verse 1. So go to verse 1. Now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. He whom thou lovest is sick. So it was known. Everybody knew it. And when Jesus stood at the tomb, at the one whom he loves tomb, the Bible says that he wept. Why was Jesus weeping? Jesus was weeping because of the state of humanity. Man's nature. Remember, Lazarus is a representation of the nature and the state of man, which is the nature of sin and the state of death and sin shut up in a tomb to prevent the stench the stench from coming out do you remember from yesterday yeah. jesus was moved to tears jesus wept because he he you see jesus is god remember and he was moved with compassion That was not how he created man to be. Man was not created to die. Man was created to live forever. But Jesus was moved. He was moved. He was moved. He was moved. <laughs> the Bible says that for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. It was his love. For us, it was his love for Lazarus, which is a type of us, that made him stand at the entrance of that tomb. Every single act of God towards us was an act of love. And it's important we understand the depth of God's love for us. Jesus Christ is the expression of God's love. For God so love, that is why he gave his only begotten son, isn't it? Yes. Have you read First John three sixteen? Please stop playing, or else you change there. The message will change. I'm becoming more spirit. You understand? So I'm unable to say the scriptures I'm, I'm supposed to say because it's, that's why I'm still stalling. Okay. I feel like ministering right now. I tell you. <laughs> that's how powerful music is. Have you read First John three sixteen before? Not John three sixteen. First John. 3.16. Show it to us. 1 John 3.16. says the same thing as this one. Yes. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. John 3.16 says to us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This one says, by this we perceive or know the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Then he says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So God so loved us, he gave his only begotten son for the purpose of 
taking away what kept man in that tomb. What kept Lazarus in that tomb? Sin is what brings death. So man dies because of sin. You know that? Yes, man dies because of sin. Man was not made to die. Man was made to live forever. But sin, okay, is what brought in death. And Jesus came down because of love. But God commended his love towards us. In that while we're yet sinners, Christ died. So Jesus, who is the representation of God's love, and the representation of the expression of God, grace is the expression of God's love. Do you get it? Grace is what? Yes. Grace is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the expression of God's love to humanity. So Jesus, you know, Jesus said, come forth, Lazarus, come forth. But allegorically, that come forth, okay, is an expression of what Jesus, Jesus' work of bringing humanity out of death into life. Yes. Bringing humanity out of death into life. And yesterday I started explaining to you how that Jesus actually died to take away sin, to remove sin, in order to bring us into life. I want us to continue from, let's see where we can continue from. Where do you want us to continue from? <laughs> Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He's talking about Jesus. Let's read from verse 24 so you see that he's talking about Jesus. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So he's discussing Jesus our Lord, isn't it? Then it says, Jesus our Lord was delivered for our offenses. Jesus was delivered on account of our offenses. How did Jesus work out our salvation? He worked out our salvation by giving himself over, by taking the punishment for the sins of humanity. So he says that he was delivered on our account, on the account of our offenses, of our wrongs, of our problems. Always remember, that without the shedding of blood, there cannot be the remission of sin. Or there cannot be the forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sins is not possible without blood being seen. If blood is not shed, blood is a, is a representation of death. Or blood shows that death has occurred. If blood is seen, just imagine if you come to church and you see a lot of blood on the ground. What would, what would you think? Someone has died. Something has happened. Do you see? When blood is shed... It shows that death has already occurred. Do you see? So God, you see, I, I, I was trying to explain to you how that the justice of God and the judgment of God does not allow for anybody to go scot-free. If you sin, the soul that sin it, it must die. So someone, some, we needed to die. All of us needed to die. All of us. Because we have broken the law. All of us have broken the law. What Adam did is what all of us did. He's a figurehead. We were all in him. So what he did was what all of us did. And all of us needed to die. Turn to the nearest person who needed to die and ask the person, how are you? <laughs> I tell you. You see, what I just said is in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. It says, and almost all things are by the Lord purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, is no remission. Remission means forgiveness. Forgiveness is not possible until blood is shed. When blood is shed, then you can be forgiven. And the payment of sin is death. Death is blood being shed. When blood is shed, then you can be forgiven. We owe so much. Humanity owed so much that, I mean, it was impossible for us to pay. You, you, we couldn't pay. Let me show you how much humanity owed. Do you want to know how much you and I owed? Each and every one of us owed. Hmm. Matthew chapter, um, let me find the verse for you. Yes. <laughs> 
Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. Hmm. Matthew 18, 23. He says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. This king was going to take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon or take account, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. This guy was owing his, his master 10,000 talents. Now, a talent, you, for you to get a talent in, in Jewish days, in those days, you needed to work for 16 years to get one. Did you hear what I said? You needed to work for how many years? 16 years without eating, drinking, or buying anything for yourself. All the things that you, you, uh, you work, you don't touch the money. You needed to work like that for 16 years. 16 years of labor. Amplified. Amplified version says $10 million. $10 million. Ah, when, when he began to, one who owed him 10,000 talents. This is what? Amplified? This, it means this is amplified. Classic. The classic would say it. Yes. Probably about $10 million. Actually, it's even not saying it right. Because 10 million is, too, is still too small. You can pay 10 million. You see, in, in, <laughs> in talent terms, you needed to work for 16 years to get one talent. And the guy, without eating, drinking, or buying anything for yourself, and the guy was owing 10,000 talents. 10,000 times 16 is how much? 160,000. So the guy needed to work 160,000 years in order to be able to pay back what he owed. From Adam to Jesus was 4,000 years. From Jesus to now, it's just about 2,000 years. That's 6,000. Since the beginning of man up to now, it's just been 6,000 years. So just try and wrap your mind around 160,000 years of labor. How are you going to pay? That is how much you and I owed. Individually. I tell you. Before you were born, you were a slave. How are you going to survive? One sixty thousand. It means you have to die, come, work, die, go and come, die, go and come, die, go and come, die, die so many times, come back so many times. One sixty thousand years. Come back as a cow, do all kind of things. Hey, how are you going to survive? It's a hopeless case. But Jesus, who is God? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus' blood is the blood of God. Jesus was impregnated. You know, uh, Jesus' mother was impregnated by God. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. It's in the Bible. The pregnancy, God was responsible for the pregnancy. The Holy Spirit was the Father. Yes. And when he had been, Matthew 1 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother, Mary, was a spouse of Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was responsible for the child. I tell you. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> he was responsible for the child. He was involved. The Bible says that the spirit of the highest shall overshadow you. Yeah. Uh, that, that is a great mystery. The fact that God could become a man. It's a great mystery. The owner of all the world. Maybe you don't know who Jesus is. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Verse, verse 16. Colossians 1, 16. He says, for by him. He's talking about Jesus. And he says, for by Jesus were all things created. The one by whom all things were created. You know, the ASV says, in him where all things created. So Jesus is the place of creation. Wow. Do you have ASV? American Standard Version. This is Kenya. You must have American Standard Version. <laughs> not easy. ASV. A. Not E. A. A for Apple. A for Apple. <laughs> Do you have it? AK-47. AK 
You know, because it, it, it shows you, the uh, uh, ASB shows you the various things that Jesus represents. It says, Jesus, and uh, he, for in him, so ASB will say, for in him were all things created. In him. He is the place of creation. Mm? That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or, or principalities or powers. It says, all things were created by him. He is the one who brought creation into existence. And all things were created for him. He's the reason for all creation. He's the place of creation. He's the means of creation. He's the reason for creation. This Jesus, he's all you know, came into this world to come and come and share his precious blood. So in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, Peter tells the people, he says, don't, don't, look, show it to us, please. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed. Eh? Yes. Where is it? Uh -huh. He says, for as much as you know, you should know that you were not redeemed. He says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed, the word redeemed means to buy back or to pay, to pay the ransom price. You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. The debt we owed, silver could not pay. There's no money you can use to pay. There's no silver you can use to pay. There's no gold you can use to pay from your vain conversation, received from tradition from your fathers. Next verse. But with the precious blood of Christ, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spots, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, offered himself for the purpose of removing your sin. He was delivered on account of our offenses. It is our offenses that killed him. He had done nothing wrong. In him was no sin. Isn't it? He knew no sin. He did no sin. These are verses concerning Jesus' life. Yes, yet without sin. He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. He was innocent. No, no problem. It was our sin that killed him. Wow. He paid the price. Remember, he says, when I'm lifted up, I'll draw all judgment onto myself. So he took all the judgment and he became the very same. You know those three hours where when he was hanging on the cross and the, the, the heavens became dark, he was, the three hours, those three hours, he was taking the, in the sin of humanity. Yes, he was taking in the sin of humanity. You see, and Jesus didn't only take in the sin of humanity. He also took the curse of humanity. Listen, when you break the law, okay, you are, there are curses related to breaking the law. Can any human being say that he has not broken the law? You can't. First of all, the law is not even given to you to be able to keep. I showed you that yesterday, isn't it? Let me show you, let me show you some of the reasons why the law is given. So you can write in your notes, the purpose of the law. Yes, let me show it to you, the purpose of the law. And keep it in your mind that when you break the law, you are in trouble. There are curses, brother. There are curses. There are curses. Doing the law came with blessings. If you could do the law, you have blessings. They are found in Deuteronomy 28 from verse 1 to verse 14. Now, verse 13 even. Just a few blessings. From Deuteronomy 28 from verse 14, 15, all the way to 68, to 68, where 52 curses, 52 curses for not, keep, for, for not keeping the law, for breaking one. When you break one, all the curses, you broke, when you break one, remember, when you break one, you are broken what? All. And you get the punishment for, for all. 52 curses. There are curses that were related to you not you marry and someone will sleep with your wife. One of the one of the cases was that you marry and you will not you will not have first first, first whatever someone who yeah isn't this there? You will build it. You will build it. Not live in it. Is it verse 30, 28, 30. Did you twenty eight thirty? Yeah. Thou shalt be true to the wife. Let's read easy English. Let it, let's make it easy. Hey, it's fearful. Though. Breaking the law was a very wild thing. A woman will promise to marry you. Eh? Tell me, a woman will promise to marry you. 
but another man will take her and have sex with her. Hey! It's a case. You will build a house, but you will not live in it. You will plant a garden, but you will never eat the fruit that grows in it. 52 cases. And out of the 52, 35 were related to cases related to poverty. Yes. Out of 52, 35 is poverty. I tell you. I tell you. It's wild. There were cases of boils, of cancer, of sickness. I tell you. He says, you'll be sold in the market and nobody will buy you. You'll be sold as a slave. They are selling you. Like your life has been reduced to the lowest portion. They are selling you. And nobody will want to buy you. Oh! <laughs> I tell you, pastor says some girls advertise themselves for someone to buy. Nobody buys. Maybe they're under the curse. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, curse is 52 curse. It's wild. That, that was what every human being deserved. This is what every human being deserves. Wow. Hmm. No one, it, ah, you, found, you found it. That's verse 68. And the Lord shall bring, can you read easy version? The Lord told you that you must never travel on the road back to Egypt, but he will send you back to Egypt in ships. In Egypt, you will try to sell yourselves to, be, to your enemies as slaves, but no one will agree to buy you. That's the last one. Even your enemies will not agree to buy you. Because if you are bought as a slave, at least they can feed you. will be fed here and there. Hey! Curses. I tell you. Curses. Wild curses. And this is what every human being deserves. Guess what? Jesus comes on the scene. I said Jesus comes on the scene. Let me show you a verse. Hmm. Leviticus chapter 21. Hmm. You like Leviticus. Verse 18. No, 23. Look at 23, rather. I hope I'm seeing the right thing. Let me check it for you. Hallelujah. Curses everyone that hangs on the tree. Okay, so it's actually Deuteronomy 21, not Leviticus. Deuteronomy 21. Verse 18. Deuteronomy 21, 18. It says, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, hmm? are you in the church? Yes. Which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they chase, chasten him, he will not hearken unto them. This is a a prodigal son. Okay? Next verse. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out of, unto, the, unto the elders of his city and unto the gates of his place. Next verse. And they shall say unto the elders of his, of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a gluton and a drunkard. Next verse. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones. Are you seeing the requirements of the law? They shall stone him, stone him with stones that he die. So shall thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. He says, All rebellious children should be stoned to death. You'd have died a long time ago. When you were 18, you wouldn't have survived. You wouldn't have gotten to 20. The Bible says that all we like sheep have gone astray. All of humanity. Eh, have gone astray. We've not minded God. 
we were rebellious to God, and what we deserved was stoning to death. But you see, it is not only stoning that we deserved, because we have also broken the, case, the, the law, and the law comes with curses. You have to be stoned, and you, you, are, you are cursed. And the, the next one is for, the, is for the curse. Look at the next verse. All those who are cursed. Go back to Deuteronomy 21 we're reading. You see? It, then he says, and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, guy, the guy committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. Next verse. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is cursed, a curse of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God has given, gives thee, blah, blah, blah. You get it? So he says, you must, the one who is hanged is cursed. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, look at Galatians 3, 13. It says, Christ has also has redeemed us from the curse of the Lord. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the Lord, being made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And Jesus was crucified on a tree. So Jesus could have died by stoning. Because if he was only going to take our place as prodigal sons, which we were, then he could have died by stoning. The Jews tried to stone him twice, but it couldn't work. Do you remember? Yes. It couldn't work because that was being stoned to death alone would not take the curse of the law. It can only remove the problem of rebellious children. But he needed to be hanged on a tree in order to take away the curse that we had. The curse of the law as well. I don't know if you get it. Yes. Do you get it? Yes. So Jesus had to go to the cross. He had to go to a tree and be hanged so that in his death, he removed the curse that was written. <laughs> Listen, the whole of humanity was cursed, I tell you. Fully cursed because everybody has broken the law. And Jesus, our substitute, Jesus came as our substitute to remove the curse. Yes, to take the curse on our behalf. So Jesus was cursed for us. Curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. I see you know what I'm talking about. Yes. So Jesus was... <laughs> oh, I don't know if you can if you can you can see this Jesus I'm talking about. Look at what he did for you. Because of Jesus, you cannot be cursed. Can you imagine that because of Jesus you cannot be cursed? It's like you don't like what I'm saying. I don't know if you like what I'm saying. You like it? Yeah. Because of Jesus, you cannot be cursed. Why? Because he has taken the curse that is related to breaking God's laws. He has taken it away. Once and for all. Completely. Hmm. Let me show you the law. Remember, I was going to show you the purpose of the law. But I just brought this in to sh show, show you what Jesus has done for us. Now, the law hmm, had the purpose. So, the purpose of the law. Number one. The law is to give the knowledge of sin. That's the purpose of the law. To give the knowledge of sin. Romans 3.20 For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. When you, when you get to know the law, the knowledge of sin is introduced to you. You will never know that touching this thing is, is not good, it's not correct. Until they write on it, touch not. Do not touch. What will you do? You will touch it. Why? Because a law has been introduced to you that do not touch. Because a law has been introduced to you, you will touch. So <laughs> the law was given to give the knowledge of sin. Okay? Romans chapter 7 verse 7 says the same thing. Romans 7 7. Paul says, I, I, I did not know what sin was unless I was told. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I have not known sin, but by the law. It is the law that I get by the law that I get to know sin. For I had not known lust except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. Then I got to know that actually there's something called covet coveting. Are you seeing it? Okay. Number two, 
the law was given to reveal sin. To reveal sin. Romans chapter 7, verse 13. In other words, sin was hiding all that while, but the law was given to reveal, to let sin, sin show. Was then that which was good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. I don't know if you, you got it. It's, it's, it's a bit some way. Let's, let's read a lighter version so we can understand. That's what is English. But, but someone might say, this means that something good brought death to you. No, God's law did, did not do that. It was sin that brought death to me. Sin used God's good law. You see? Sin used God's good law to show that I was guilty. Have you seen it? So sin is, can only be revealed when God's law is brought. You would not know what is sin unless the law is brought to, to you to tell you that this is sin. So sin is revealed. Sin hides until the law is given. I, I get in. Okay. Because of that, we can see that sin is really very bad. The command is God's law. The commands in God's law help to show that sin is completely bad. So the law of God brings out sin. Okay? Hmm. Are you in the church or you've gone to, you've gone to bed? The next point is to reveal sin. The law was given to reveal sin. So just imagine a Christian who's trying to live his life by the law. It's going to give you the knowledge of sin. I just said reveal sin. Okay, to revive sin. Revive. To give sin re revival. Romans chapter 7 verse 8. It says, but sin... Taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Sin was dead without the law. Next verse. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment. Have I missed something? He missed it, right? Let's read verse 8 to verse 9, please. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. So sin was dead. When there's no law, sin is dead. Next verse. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. A Christian who is trying to live by the law will have the revival of sin in his life all the time. Are you seeing it? It is to revive sin. <laughs> Next point. It is to strengthen sin. The law is given to strengthen sin. Yeah. Not just revive, but give it strength. First Corinthians fifteen fifty six. Yes, revive and strengthen. It's, it's too out. <laughs> the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is what? The, the strength of sin is what? The, the strength of sin is what? The law. the law is what strengthens sin. Yes. Hmm. The, next, the next one. To increase sin. Yes. Romans chapter 5 verse 20. To increase sin. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. It says the law entered so that the offense might abound. The law entered so that the offense, the sins, may increase. Let's read other versions so I can understand it. Yes. Other version. God's law is given so that all people could see how sinful they were. It is to increase sin. Let's see other places. Other versions. Which one? Message version. Do you have message? Yes. Message. It's a message. Message. Give me the message. All that passing laws, all that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. Have you seen it? It's to produce more lawbreakers. That's, that's the purpose of sin. To increase sin. To increase sin. To have more law, lawbreakers. Hey. <laughs> the next one is to impute sin or to put sin in your account. The purpose of the law was to put sin into your account. Okay, that's in Romans chapter 5, verse 
13. For unto the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there's no law. Let's read the other version so I can understand it. Sin is not imputed. You cannot accuse somebody of sin when there's no law. So the law was given so that we can be able to put sin into people's account. To let you know, ah, you've broken the law. Now you are owing. You have also broken the law. You are now owing. He says, before God gave his law to Moses, people did wrong things. Sin was already there in the world. But at that time, God did not say that people were guilty because there was no law for them to obey. So when the law comes, then God can now say that you are guilty. Do you get it? So the law is given so that you, we can impute sin. Sin can be imputed. Sin can be put into people's accounts. So I don't know how much you had. I've showed you 10,000. You were owing 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. Yes, 160,000 years. BB of this verse. Do you have BB, Bible in basic English? Do you have BB? B for boy, E for English, B for boy. Do you have that one, BB? You don't have that. Okay, no problem, it's fine. The next one. There's more. There's more. The next one, to make sin dominate man. The law is given so that sin can dominate man. Hey! You try to live by the law, you're in trouble. You are better off living by grace than living by the law. <laughs> Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So when you are under the law, sin has dominion over you. Are you seeing it? For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Meaning that when you are under the law, sin dominates you. Make sense? Beautiful. Next one. Another one. How many do you have? Eight. Nine. Number nine. There are ten of them. This is number eight. Okay. To show all men how guilty they are. It's to show all men how guilty they are. Galatians chapter 3 verse 19. Galatians 3, 19. It says, Wherefore then said the law? It was added because of transgression. The law was added because of, let's read, easy. Make it easy, brother. Okay, NLT, 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 New Living Translation. Yes, let's translate it, NLT. Can you read it to me? One to go. business it was given to show people their sins it is to show you that you are guilty that's the purpose of the law I seen it last one to make all men guilty before God all men to make all men guilty before God Romans 3 verse 19 Romans 3 verse 19 now we know that what things over the law said is here to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The law was given so that all men will become guilty before God. It is to make you guilty before God. I see in it. Yes. yes. So the law was against us. You remember, the, the stone is the law. You remember, the stone is the law. And it was given to keep the dead dead because look at the purpose look at the reason why it was given to revive sin to make sin increase to to all these things to reveal sin to make sin, sin exit to make you guilty to strengthen sin oh how can you survive you can't survive you can't survive so when jesus came you see when jesus came jesus took all the the debt that we owed is when you break the law, you are owing. You owe God. Remember, it's 10,000. It's not the devil you owed. We didn't owe the devil. He had, no business. he had no business with the whole transaction. We owed the throne of God. We didn't owe the devil. Remember the, par the, the parable I showed you in Matthew 18, 23. He says there was a king who was taking account of his servants. Do you see? Yes. And the, the king forgave the guy. Have you seen the devil forgiving anybody? The devil does not have an op he doesn't he doesn't forgive. He doesn't he doesn't have that capacity to forgive. He doesn't have what? That nature to forgive. 
Do you remember? Yeah. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. And as much as he had not, not to pay, for, but as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payments to be made. He said, pay, pay us. Next verse. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. Next verse. He was lying. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. It's only God who is moved with compassion. Remember, Jesus was moved with compassion when he came to the tomb. So he cried. Do you see? He was moved with compassion. And for... No, he's... And what? He loosed him and forgave him the debt. He forgave him all that he owed. It's only God who forgives so actually we're owing God, not the devil. The devil has no thing, no, no place in it. At all. He's not involved. At the cross, God's love paid ransom to God's justice and judgment. That's what happened at the cross. It was, it was everything was God. In the Old Testament, when they were going to make atonement for themselves, they needed a lamb. Okay, can, can we get a lamb? Lamb, sinner, high priest. High priest, come. Sinner, come. Lamb, come. High priest, stand here. Sinner. Lamb, go down. So this is the, this is the lamb. Okay? This is the lamb that this guy, this is, the, this is the sinner. He has brought a lamb to come and pay for his sin. When he comes, he lays hands on him, lay hands on him. When he lays hands on him, two things happen. The first thing is identification. He's identified with the lamb. So he's going to be treated, the lamb is going to be treated as him because he's now identified with the lamb. The second thing that happens is imputation. That means that his sin is put into the lamb's account because the lamb is now identified as him. So his sin moves from him and then goes into the, the lamb. Do you get it? That he does all this before the high priest comes. He does all this before the high priest. He lays his hands on the lamb, confesses, his sin is moved into the lamb. He's identified as the sin moves. When he does that, the, the high priest will give him a sword. Give it to the sinner. And then he, the sinner is told to kill the... So kill him. <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's a personal vendetta. Is there? Yeah. <laughs> he has meant him since those times. Yeah. When the lamb dies... You see, when the lamb dies, he is dead because the lamb was identified with him and his sin was transferred to the lamb. And he's the one who killed the lamb. He's given the sword to kill the lamb to let him know that it is his sin. Listen, you need to know that it is your sin that killed Jesus. You need to understand that fact. That it is, your, it is not someone's sin. It is yours. Tell anybody it is yours. Put your, your hand on your neighbor's nose. It is your, it is your sin. It is your sin. Now, can you imagine that? Listen, can you, not the Romans, not the Jews. It's your sin. I, please go down. Before this guy even lays his hands on this thing, this lamb, the high priest will come and inspect the lamb to check and see if there's no blemish, <laughs> if there's no spot, if everything is okay with it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> he will check to see if everything is fine with the lamb. Do you see? If there's any fault, it will be rejected. If there's no fault, then it is accepted. Now, the acceptor, notice, have you noticed that it is not this guy they are checking? They are not checking the sinner for faults. Who are they checking for faults? They are checking the lamb for faults. Who is our lamb? The lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Who is he? Have you read that scripture before? Yeah. John chapter 1. There's what? 35. The Lamb of God that taketh away. And again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples. Next verse. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. This is, this is different. So Jesus was both the Lamb of God and the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. They are not the same. In this one, he's talking about the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God that brings righteousness. I'll, go, I'll talk about it in a minute. But there's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's what I'm talking about now. 29. That's in verse 29. Same guy mentions it. John the Baptist mentions it. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And that Lamb that taketh the sin of the world is what is inspected. The perfection of the Lamb is the perfection of the one giving the sacrifice. 
The acceptance of the lamb is the acceptance of the one giving the sacrifice. When this lamb is killed, this guy can go free because he's not done anything wrong. Blood has been seen. Blood needed to be shed. Now blood has been shed. This guy has died in his place. Have you seen it? Yeah. Now, when Jesus came, look at it. Jesus is the Lamb of God that will take it away the sin of the world. Isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. I'm trying to see how to make it very easy for you to understand. The, the blood of this Lamb is taken by the high priest. So the high priest takes the blood. Then he takes it to the heavenly, he takes it to the holy of holies. Do you see? And he takes it to the holy place and drops it at the entrance of the holy of holies. Okay? The entrance of the holy of holies had a big curtain that separated it from the holy place. Most holy place. There's the most holy place, there's the holy place, then there's the outer court. I hope I'm not confusing you. I'm not. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. I, I, it's, it's fine. Let me not. I don't want to confuse you. So, what I want you to notice is that Jesus is both the lamb. Jesus was the lamb. Okay? Jesus was a lamb. He's the lamb of God that take the high priest, the, the, the sins of the world. At the same time, Jesus also is the high priest. He is the lamb. And he is the high priest. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Hmm. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So Jesus is high priest who makes reconciliation for the sins of the people. The word reconciliation here is, it means to make atonement. If you have other versions, it will help. Do you have other um, uh, um, NLT or something like that? Wherefore it behoved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make proper, this one says propitiation, okay, for the sins of the people, or to make atonement for the sins. So he's the high priest who is qualified to take the blood. The, the high priest must be qualified. If he's not qualified, he can't take the blood in there. In the Old Testament, before the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, he needed to be tied, he needed to tie a rope around him. You know that? Because if he goes in there and dies, nobody can enter. And if the, if the dead is kept there, everybody's going to die. So when, he, when they noticed that, and there were, there were bells around his skirt, he, every, all the high priests had skirts, and there were bells attached to their skirts, just to help the people outside of the Holy of Holies to hear his movement. So when he moves, you hear cling, cling, so that they know that he's alive. If the bells stop ringing for more than a minute, they know that mm, the guy is gone. Then they can pull him out. Do you get it? The high priest needed to be qualified. Jesus is the qualified high priest. It's our qualified high priest who makes <laughs> propitiation for our sins. Or he, he's the one who makes, he takes the blood. Only he can take the blood. At the same time, Jesus is also the mercy seat. In the Holy of Holies, there was, a, there was the mercy seat. That, that's where God is. The mercy seat is a representation of God. The Bible says that Jesus is also the mercy seat. That's in Rom, uh, Romans chapter 3. Verse 25. Look at Romans 3.25. I hope I'm not confusing you. I'm just trying to let you know that the devil is nowhere in the process of our redemption. He's nowhere. He's no, do you see the devil anywhere? You see a sinner, his sacrifice, the high priest, and then the holy of all the mercy seat. Jesus, you are, we are the sinners. Jesus took, became our sin. Jesus rose from the dead as our high priest. And Jesus is the mercy seat. Where is the devil in all this? He's nowhere. He's just a bad boy who is the first sinner and is, 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 is the first person to go to the prison of sin. And is just bullying anyone who comes there. So the devil, the devil cannot use uh, your, your great grandmother, what your great grandmother did, whatever, to accuse. It's, no, it doesn't work. Jesus is more powerful than your great, what your great grandmother did. And Jesus sacrificed himself for all those things. Once and for all. Once and for all. Once and for all. You see, your pastor said, once and for all. It is once and for all. You better believe it. You better believe it. Jesus took it. 
Oh. He took it. Oh. He was made sin. Who knew no sin? When Jesus was hanging on the cross, okay, in John chapter 19, Jesus says something. Remember, the law, you see, all the things that were done in the Old Testament could not remove sin. It's only covered sin. So there was, there was a big book, a big record of the sins of humanity and what humanity owed. All of us were owing. Colossians chapter, chapter 2, verse 14. Let's read from verse 13 so I can even understand it. Colossians 2, 13. Thank you very much. You may kindly take your seat. Let's give them a round of applause. I'm just trying to show you, come forth. Come forth. That statement, come forth, it means a lot. Allegorically, it means a lot. It, it, it means all the work of Christ. <laughs> That's what it means. So he says, and you, being dead in your, in your sins, this was the state of humanity, this is Lazarus, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Do you see? Has he quickened or made that? Let's read lighter, but you don't understand. NLT. NLT. Can you read it to me? One to go. Then God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave all our sins. He forgave how many? All Are you sure? All our sins? So why do you behave as though he's not forgiving you some of your sins? What Jesus paid was far more than what we owed. Jesus' over, Jesus's blood was an overpayment of what we owed. Yes. Overpayment. Overpayment. It's actually more than double. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 40. It's been paid for. Everything. He says, comfort, comfort my people, say, says your God. Be comforted. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Actually, it is the Lord has paid twice over for all of King James. King James. Verse 2, King James. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That she has received of the Lord's that the Lord has paid double for all her sins. Can you see what I'm talking about? Jesus paid more than double for all that we owed. Jesus is the one who was punished. He took it away. All the handwritings of ordinances of debt that was owed, Jesus took it and nailed it to his cross. All the debt. You know, when you, those times when you are owing, they write your debts down. They write your debts down. All your debts are owed. When Jesus came, he paid all the debts, you see, and he, he canceled it. He took it and nailed it to his cross. Just like going to the bank when you are, going to, uh, you are using a check, and then they, they, they pay you the money. After they give you the money, what do they do? They put the check on a, a, a stick. They put on a metal just to destroy it, to let you know that it's hanged. It's done. It can't be. It's not useful anymore. Are you seeing it? Yeah. That's what Jesus did. Colossians chapter, chapter 2, verse 13 where we're reading. Okay? If you remember, we're just reading how that Jesus eh, and you being dead in your trespasses, your sins and the circumcision of your flesh has he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all, not some, all trespasses. Next verse. Then he says, and Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. That was against us. He's talking about the law. The handwriting of ordinances. He's talking about the law. All the things that we owed. All the amount of money that we owed. All the things, all the debts that we owed. Jesus blotted it all out. That was against us. It was against us. Which was contrary to us. And took it out of the way. Nailing it to his cross. So he knew the cross is very powerful. The cross is very significant. It, ha it had to be the cross because the, the, the ordinances needed to be nailed. 
It needed to be paid and nailed. And he paid and nailed it to his cross. So that you can walk away, just like this guy walked away free. You can walk away curse free. Remember, he was hung on the cross to take away the curse. And he was hung on the cross to nail all the, all the, all the debts that we owed. I don't know why you are, you are worrying yourself. You cannot be cursed. You cannot be cursed. God wants you to know these things. God wants you to know that it's been fully paid. Because it has been fully paid, now God has the foundation to declare you not guilty and to declare you righteous. It's the, the basis of our being declared not guilty is the fact that Jesus paid all. So Jesus became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He was made sin who knew no sin. Jesus was made sin who knew no sin. So that you and I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So sin, he removed sin. Remember, he was given an account of our offenses. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Don't sleep, oh. I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. Romans 4, 25. NLT. You are doing well, my brother. Let's clap for Mr. Be uh, uh, the brother who doesn't have a beloved. Can you read it to me? One to go. Have you seen it? Uh -huh. And? He was raised to life, so he died because of our sins, and he was raised to life for our justification, for our righteousness. So as you are sitting here, when you, when you receive Jesus Christ, our Lord and personal Savior, what has happened to you now? You have died. We identified with him in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. His death was for, the dying, for, for our, our sin and death to be removed that way, for us to be forgiven. And his resurrection is for us to be declared righteous. So as you are sitting here, you are not a sinner. I'm going back to Accra. I thought you, you agree with what... Because I've taken two, yesterday and today just to say the statement that you are not a sinner. And it's like you still... I've said a lot, but it's like you still don't believe it because you believe that you are, you are still a sinner. Are you a sinner? No. What are you now? You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Let me show it to you. Please take your seat. Sin has been dealt with. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. By the doings of the law, no, no one can be made righteous. The law cannot make you righteous. Obeying the law cannot make you righteous. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is what brings the knowledge of sin. I've told you this already. Next verse. Because of that, there's something else that God has made available. He says, but now... The righteousness of God without the law is manifested. There's something called the righteousness of God. The rightness of God. That has now been revealed or made manifested. Okay? And this righteousness, which is called the righteousness of God, okay, has been, it says it was being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It was spoken of by the law and the prophets. NLT, we don't understand. Let, let's just make it easy. Yes. Make it, I hope it will, it will say it right. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him. When you hear made right with him, he's talking about righteousness. Okay? But now God has made, shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. You don't need, there's a way now that you don't, there's a way to becoming righteous which has nothing to do with the law. It's English. I hope it will say the same because there is English, it's different, different versions. Okay, it's English. But now we know how to become right with God. God has, is it the same? You see, it's not the same. Do you have Bible in basic English? He says he doesn't have it. You've downloaded it. Okay, BB, Bible in basic, ah, Bible in basic English. But now without the law, there's a revelation of the righteousness of God to which witness is given by the law and the prophets. In other words, the law and the prophets, do you know the law? The law is Genesis to, uh, to, to Deuteronomy. The laws of what, what Moses wrote. 
He says, Moses wrote concerning this righteousness that was going to come. And the, the prophet represents Isaiah, Jeremiah, all these guys. He says, all of them spoke concerning this righteousness that was going to come. But now, without the Lord, there's a revelation of the righteousness of God to which witness is given by the, the law and the prophets. Next verse. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Verse 22, please. Oh, I hope you catch this. That is the righteous, this is it's called the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ. When you believe in Jesus Christ, that righteousness is given to you. This is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. To all those who have faith, and one man is not different from another. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. How Jews and Gentiles are not different from each other. They both missed it. You should read the whole chapter, you see it. Then he goes to the next verse. Because all men, for all, the reason why one man is not different from another is because all men have done wrong and are far from the glory of God. So this verse, this verse is not saying that all of us are sinners. It's an interjection. It's like saying, um, Pastor Boni is a boy. Okay. It's like saying, Pastor Boni is going to uh, HQ, comma, Pastor Boni is a boy, comma, then you continue. Yeah. Pastor Boni is a boy, it's not the focus. He's just describing to you why he is going to do, who is going. Yes. But we've taken this particular one and made it our life. I don't know if I'm making sense. You understand? Yeah. He says there's a righteousness that has been made available. It's called the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. And that righteousness is for all. It's for everyone, both Jews and Gentiles, because everybody has sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Do you understand it? Okay. For all have done wrong and have gone are far from the glory of God. Next verse, verse 24. You see, it doesn't stop. It's not a full stop. Go back. It's not a full stop, is it? It's a semicolon. It's just continuing. Next verse. And they may have righteousness. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. For all have done wrong. Can you put it together? 23 and 24. Ha, ah, this is nice. Yeah. 23 and 24. Together. This is 23. Uh -huh. We are waiting for 24. Is it going to work? Oh, beautiful task work. Let's clap for our brother. <laughs> Working. Can you read it to me? One to go. And they may have righteousness put to their credit freely by his grace through the salvation which is in Christ. Do you understand it now? He says now everybody can have righteousness put to the account freely by his grace through salvation which is in Christ Jesus so when you believe in Jesus Christ you receive that's it righteousness is imputed to you just like the law is imputing sin now your faith in Jesus Christ imputes righteousness to you So have you believed in Jesus Christ? The person said, yeah. What are you now? You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Guess what? Life. Life. Hmm. He says, those, those who are righteous by faith shall live. Have you read Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 before? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes, everyone that believes, is the power of God to salvation, to everyone that believes. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein, for in the gospel, for in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. The gospel is the revelation 
of the righteousness of God. You can't say you preach the gospel and if you've not, if, and if not shown me the righteousness of God. For therein, for in the gospel, is the revelation of the righteousness of God. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Then it says, as it is, as it is written, the just, who is the, what's the meaning of just? Righteous. The righteous shall live by faith. Actually, that's not how it reads. It's not the righteous, the just shall live by faith. The, the, I don't know if any verse will help us. Can you find any version that can help us? I think Amplified does the right job. Amplified classic. It reads like this. That those who are righteous by faith shall live. For in the gospel, uh, righteousness, for in the gospel righteousness which God is, as Christ is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith, disclosed to the way of faith that arouses to more faith. As is written, the man who through faith is just. You see, the man who through faith is righteous shall live. Wow. <laughs> My message also tries to help. The man who through faith is just, who through faith is righteous shall live. So come forth from death into life is come into righteousness. It's righteousness so that you can live. The way to, you cannot live. It's only, who are, it's only those who are righteous by faith who can live. They are the ones who can live and live in the, live in the power of God, live in the grace of God. Message, message version. Massage, let's massage the scripture. God's will, can, can we read it together? I think it would be nice if we read it together. Am I saying something that is not in the Bible? Am I showing you scriptures? I'm just hoping to read it properly. That's all I'm doing. That's why I came all the way from Ghana. <laughs> okay, so let's read it together. One to go. The person in right standing before God by trusting in Him really lives. The person in right standing before God by trusting in him really lives. Because there was a righteousness that comes by the law. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, right? 3 and 4. There is therefore now no, 3 and 4, please. He says, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, rather believe that Jesus came to die for sin. No, it's everywhere in the Bible. He says he condemns sin in the flesh. So that the righteousness of the law, there was a righteousness that was by the law. If you did all that the law said, then you will have right standing before God. If you didn't break any one law, then you will have right standing before God. Nobody could qualify. Nobody could qualify. He says Jesus has come to sacrifice himself so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. When you get born again, you are now in the spirit. Because you are in the spirit, you are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The, it's called righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God is equal to righteousness that is by faith in Jesus Christ. All you need to do is to believe in Jesus Christ. When you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior, you believe in his death, you believe in his burial, you believe in his resurrection, righteousness is imparted to you. The righteousness of God is imparted to you. And it's by faith. If you have, by your faith, by your faith in Jesus. And that is what Abraham found. That is, that is, that is the, the, this is the, you see, the promise. Negosh Anahai. What Abraham discovered is called the righteousness, which is by faith. Not by law. Not by works. But by faith. Simple believing in Jesus Christ. That's the righteousness that Abraham found. Romans chapter 4. Verse 1. Yes. Verse 1. Let's read. Light out version. NLT. Can we read it together? NLT. One to go. Our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? Abraham discovered something. You want to know what he discovered? 
Next verse. Want to go? If his good deeds made him, he would have had something to boast about. Yeah. Next verse. For the scripture tells us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous. I'm going home. Bye-bye. I'll finish my message. This is what Abraham discovered. That you can be made righteous by believing in Jesus Christ. And those who, who have this righteousness, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, are the ones who live. Let me show you what it means to live. Drop down to verse, verse, verse 13. For the promise that Abraham should be the heir of all things was not given to him and to his seed. <laughs> I'm a King James boy. What I'm saying is, is that King James, what, what, what is written there? Let's read it in NLT anyway. Translate. Can you read it to, to me? One to go. Clear. Clear. Have you seen it? Yes. What was the promise that God gave to him? To give him the whole world. Those who are righteous by faith have the whole world. The whole world is yours. The gold, the silver, everything is yours. You see, an amazing when you become righteous, when you become righteous by faith in Jesus Christ, you are you are called the seed of Abraham. So you are the seed of Abraham, and the seed of Abraham has a promise, and that promise is that the whole world is yours. All things are yours. Life is yours. Death is yours. Yeah, yes, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. All things are yours. Am I helping you? That's why, oh, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world. The whole world, everything in it. You can own, you can own things. You can live proper. Why? Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. By faith, you shall live a quality, the quality of God's life that he wants for you. You can now live it. You are an heir of God. You are joint heir together with Christ Jesus. The whole world is yours. The silver is yours. Listen, God wants to give you gold mines to own you, as you standing here. He wants to give you TV stations to own. He wants to give you a whole nation. You, you, you will pastor. Listen, you will pastor the whole nation with the with with the with the president. Everybody, Amen. you are you are pastoring them. Amen. Yeah. You see, Bishop Doug is going everywhere. He's being received in a certain way. It is because it's all because of righteousness by faith, and because that righteousness by faith has made him the heir of God. The whole world is his. The, the whole world is mine. All things is mine. All things are mine. All things are mine. <sighs> Those who are righteous. So when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, his command to come forth out of the grave into life. Eh? Is the command into righteousness. Now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And now you can really and truly live in health. Health. Those who are righteous by faith shall live. They shall live in health. They shall live in strength. Don't see cancer in your future. Never. Cancer cannot dwell in your body. It's illegal. It's not possible. Those who are righteous by faith shall live. Shall live. <laughs> when they were sitting in a plane, the plane was shaking. I've never, I've sat in many planes by the grace of God. This turbulence have, I've never experienced before. People were praying in a plane. People were fighting in a plane. You know, the, the, just, the anxiety just went through their stomach. <laughs> the whole the smell of the plane changed. It was very serious. 
I, you could smell death all over the place. Yeah. I was with my, one of my fathers in the Lord, Reverend George. He said, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This plane must, it must land, stabilize. Within a, a second or two, the plane came back to normal. And we landed safely. Why? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, what you're saying is that God must treat you the way he treats Jesus. That's what they mean. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. That's what it means. It means that you believe that Jesus took your place in sin so that you can take his place in righteousness. And what Jesus did, did you see Jesus sick when he came? No. He was rather healing the sick. That is your place. The righteous by faith shall really live. They will heal the sick, not they are sick. Did you see Jesus moving around and saying, ah, I need so much money. I need money to do this. I need money to do that. When there was a need, he, he, he thanked God and it multiplied. Oh, you can, I will never come into need in my life. <laughs> that is my life. That is my life. <laughs> Look at this. Romans 5 verse 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned, death ruled without anybody's permission, whether you liked it or not. Because Adam has sinned, death was ruling and reigning on everybody. Then he says, how much more? Much more. How much more? They which receive abundance of grace. Who is, Jesus? Who is grace? Jesus Christ. How much more they will receive the blessings of Jesus Christ. The person of Jesus Christ. The glory of Jesus Christ in their lives. And of the gift of right righteousness is a gift that he gives. It's free of charge. Freely given. You don't, you don't learn. You don't earn a gift. You don't earn. It's given. By your faith in Jesus Christ, it's given to you. He says, how much more they which receive the gift of righteousness? What shall happen to them? Reign. They shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. They shall reign. They shall king. They shall reign as kings. They shall dominate. I will dominate in the ministry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I will dominate everywhere I go. Why? I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. I can never fail. It's not possible. It's not possible. I can never <laughs> I can never lose. That's the only life I know. Yeah. Why? Because of Jesus and what he has done. Because of Jesus. He says, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by, by one person called Jesus Christ. You see, so the more you, you have, the, the more righteousness conscious you are, the more you reign in this life the more you live the quality of life that God has given to us to live which is a life above remember remember breaking the law brought cases 35 of those cases was sickness was poverty sorry the rest was sickness sickness death destruction now you have you have you can rule over sickness you can rule over poverty you can rule over a, a fear you can rule over, you don't need to be afraid. You can rule over shame. Jesus was put to shame for you. When it comes to shame, Jesus intentionally allowed himself to be crucified naked. Jesus was crucified stark naked. He died as your shame so that you will never be put to shame again. The more, the more you get into what Jesus has done, the more you can live. You will live a life of confidence when you know how much Jesus was put down. Jesus was put down, 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 so that you can be lifted up, 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 up. That's why he came. That's why he came. That's why he came. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter two, verse twenty-one. Chapter 3, 21, not, not 2. Chapter 3. All things are mine. I wish I had more time. I should take time. I can push a bit more. Okay. Can you show it to us? 1 Corinthians 3, 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, in, in men, for all things are yours. All things are yours. 
all things are yours, brother. Next verse. Then he shows you the things that are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world. Or life. Or, life, or, life, or, death, or death. I can dominate death. You can dominate death. Yes. Ah, you can dominate death. Yes. Hold on, hold on. You can dominate death. Hebrews chapter 2, <laughs> verse 7. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7. Is it 14? 14, 14, 14, 14. Can you read this to me? One to go. Next verse. And delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Death is yours. Oh, you didn't understand what you read. You didn't understand. NLT, go back. Let's make it easy. Let's translate it. Easy, easy English, whichever. Whichever, which one is this? New living. Okay. One to go. Made of flesh and blood. The son also became flesh and blood. Only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Who had the power of death? He had. He doesn't have it anymore. Next verse. Only all who Do you understand it now? So if you were afraid of death, dying, Jesus came to die so that you will not have be afraid of dying. He took the power of death from the devil. It's just like David and Goliath. When David met Goliath, David had no sword in his hand. He had no sword. Goliath had a sword. What did David do? He, he killed him with a stone. Then he took his sword and chopped off his head. David used Goliath's weapon against himself. The weapon that Satan had, Goliath is a type of Satan. The weapon that Satan had was death. Jesus used death to destroy Goliath who had the power of death. You get it? So that you will not be afraid of death ever in your life. Life is yours. Death is yours. The future is yours. Even the future is yours. Go back to that place. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 22. All things are yours. I will never fail in my life. Listen, when you think about your future, be confident. Be confident about your future. The future is yours. Christ, Christ is in you for the purpose of a bright future. The Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. The word hope is elpis. That's a Greek word. And it means confident assurance. That's what it means. Confident assurance or confident expectation. Without confident what? Expectation or assurance. That's what it means. It says Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is equal to the confident expectation. The word glory means splendor, honor, beauty, blessings, joy, goodness, prosperity. Every nice thing you can think about is equal to glory. Doxa, that's what it means. So Christ in you is the confident expectation of beautiful things only. Of blessings only, of 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 what of, of of prosperity only, of honor only, of splendor only, of joy only. Your future is full of blessings. Nothing. Don't don't have. I don't have any expectation. Else. I don't plan to fail. I don't plan to. There's no. What, what are you talking about? Fail where? For the where? Do you know where we have come from? Do you know where we have come from? Do you know where we have come from? That are standing here talking to you? No, 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 no. You you will not want to see my house. Christ in me gave me a confident expectation of good only. That's why I'm here. And that's what I'm going, that's what is taking me into the future. Next year I'll be bigger and greater than I am now. The path of the just, the path of the righteous is shining brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter onto the perfect day, onto the day you leave this world. You leave this world. When you check out of this world, the devil will be happy because you, you, you have really worried him. Yes, you have, you have, you are blinding him. Yeah, you have terrorized him. Yes. Oh yes, that is your life. That's my life. Why? Why? Why is your life like that? Because of a man called Jesus Christ. Because of a man called Jesus Christ. That's why you must, you must know. You see, 
you see your love for him is based on how much you know he has loved you look at what he did for you he loved you so much that he was crucified naked for you he loved you so much yes he was naked for you to wear the best of clothing yes 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 he was quiet before his killers so that you will be confident in life. Yes. Yes. The stripes, the pain, the sickness, he took all your sickness so that you will walk in health. Not walking in health is an insult to what he did. He took away your sin, your condemnation, your guilt so that you can walk in confidence to do what he has designed for you to do yeah not walking in confidence in this life and having sin on your conscience i've done this god for you i've done this i've done that it's a show that you don't believe what he did for you yeah. Yeah. when you know how much he has loved you you will love him back you will love him back the problem is that we don't know how much he has loved us so in ephesians chapter 3 Verse 14, Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Next verse. Verse 15. Verse, verse 16 now. I just read that all this. He says, I pray that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with mind by his spirit in the inner man. The next verse. Then he says, I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, which love? He wants you to be rooted and grounded in the consciousness of his love for you. How much he has loved you. How much he has... Next verse. That you may be able to comprehend with all Christians what is the breadth and depth and depth and height of what? Of his love. And to know the love of Christ. Not to know our love for Christ. But to know the love that Christ had in our case. He wants you to know the love that Jesus has had in your case so much. He wants you to know the length of it, the depth of it, the breadth of it, the height of it. What's the length of it? He loved you so much, he left his abode in heaven. He traveled far. The father's journey of all. That's the length of his love. He left heaven and went, came to earth and continued down to hell. Why? For you. That's how much he loved you. That's the length of his love. Then he says that you may know what? The breadth of his love. He's telling you, he's asking, he wants you to know the extent to which from, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He has loved you with an everlasting love that has no, it has no beginning, has no end. Eternity to eternity. What? He chose us in him before the foundations of the earth that's how much he loves you that's how much he likes you when you're moving around thinking that god does not like you it's like he's wondering what is wrong with you because of my love for you i left heaven and came and died and went to hell because of you i've loved you that's the, the breath of his love is eternal that's how much he has loved you eh where is where is where is the best go back to that place efficient ah this is everlasting love i've loved you with the love everlasting love therefore with that loving kindness i've drawn thee this is the love of god for you Go back to that place. We have spoken about the length, right? We're spoken about the breadth. Now, the depth. He loved you so much. He went all the way to the cross. The most shameful of all deaths. The most shameful of all deaths. And was crucified and went so low. He went so low. The, the, the death on the cross is the lowest. It was for the lowest of the lowest of criminals. The basis of criminals. Yeah. He went to the lowest to bring you to the highest. You need to know his love. The more you know his love, the more you serve him. You are struggling to serve because you don't know how much he has loved you. So it's a burden. Yeah, it's a burden because you don't know how much he has loved you. The secret is to know his love for you. That's the secret. Matter of fact, knowledge is a cure for every problem the Christian has. A Christian who is fornicating needs to know 
So Paul is writing to the Corinthian church where fornication is rife. What someone is sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul says, what? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? He didn't rebuke the guy for what he did. He told the guy, don't you know? You need to know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. If you knew, you will not engage yourself in nonsense. In fun, you are sleeping around all over the place. You will not do that. You, it's a problem of knowledge. You don't know. What? Don't you? Someone took his friend to court. Paul says, what? Don't you know that you shall judge that angels? Means. It's a problem of knowledge. Don't you know that you shall judge angels? That's the problem that we have. That's why true knowledge shall just be delivered. Yes. We need light. That's what we need. You need light. The more we get to know him, the more we love him. Yeah. He went to the highest. Oh, to the lowest. To the lowest. First John chapter chapter four verse ten. The preaching vision. Hmm. Lazarus, come forth, come forth into life, come forth into righteousness, come and reign, come and dine with me. You see, he brings you into righteousness and brings you into into intimacy. Yes, and brings you into service to him. Hmm. Where's the verse? First John chapter chapter four verse ten. Can we, can we read it together? One to go. We don't have some proposition. Let's read other versions. Is English. Is English. One to go. No. Uh-huh. Love us so much. Save us from So when you know this lab, you save it. Drop down to verse 19. 19. Same book, same chapter 19. Read it to me. We are able to love God and love our people. So when you understand his love for you, then you can love. King James, look at King James of this. Let me show you two, two, two things that Jesus says shows that you love him. Okay? He says, we love him because he first loved us. So our love for him is embedded in our understanding of his love for us. The more we understand his love for us, the more we can love him. So the challenge is because you don't understand how much he has loved you. And that's why I came. You don't understand the breadth, the height, the length, the breadth. You don't understand. I pray for understanding for you. Amen. Sometimes, when I just think about what Jesus has done, I just burst into worship. I can be in my room, I can be in a car, whatever. This morning, for instance, I was just playing a song in the car. I was, I was feeling the anointing so much. You know, just loving on my Jesus. Based, and my loving on my Jesus is based on my knowledge of what he has done for me. Look at, oh, Now, then, everybody see has a song. Casting crown. Is it casting crown? No. Look, don't look too far to see how good he is. I will worship him forever, love him forever. Because this God is so good. Oh. The first version. Who, who, who knows the first version? The first verse. I know a God who is merciful and kind. Faithful and gracious. I'm the apple of his eye. The thought that fails his heart. Don't worry, it's okay, you can put it up. The thought, listen to what I'm saying. I'm the apple of his eye. The thought that fails his heart. Every morning, noon, and night. He loved me when I didn't care. He loved you when you didn't care. And was patient till I came. Running back into his arms. Look how he turned my life around. Made me a, made me a shining star. His glory to reveal. 
I will worship him forever. Love him forever. His God is too good. Why will I worship him forever? He loved me when I didn't care and was patient till I came running back into his arm. Go back, please, to, the verse, to that verse. The reason why I worship him forever is because he loved me when I didn't care and was patient. Yeah. No, go back to the, to the song. To the song. Well, you know, yeah, this is it, but the one that you showed before this, the stanza before this. Ah, I said verse, so he touched on the Bible. I worship him forever because he loved me when I didn't care and was patient till I came running back into his arms. Look how he has turned my life around and made me a shining star. His glory, my purpose in this, in this world is to reveal his glory. I will worship him forever and love him forever because his God is too, too good. Then the next one says, don't look too far to see how good he is. Just look at me. What was that verse? He took me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock. I'm standing in his righteousness. Have you seen it? It's a, it's a blessing. I will love him forever. What won't I do for him? Where won't I go for him? Paul said, the love of Christ constrains us. The love that Jesus had in our case. That is the secret to serving God. The secret to serving God is to understand his love for you. If you don't understand how much he has loved you and what price he has paid for you, you mess up your life. You use your life for nothing. Do you understand how much he has loved you? Yes. He's beloved and the redeemed. Ah, what a blessing. So my job is to meditate on his love for me. To meditate on his love for me. Oh, Jesus. Thank you for what you have done. I don't know if you can remember how you would have turned out. If you, if you, if you, if you can remember how you would have, how would you have turned out? Where would you have been? What would you have been? If it wasn't for his mercy. But God was rich in mercy. For his great love where he loved us. Even when we're dead in sins, has he made us alive? made us alive together with Christ Jesus. I'll preach every, I'll preach what he wants me to preach. I'll go where he wants me to go. Yes. I'll do what he wants me to do. Yes. Yes. Paul says, for the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ, it compels us. It, it moves us. We are, Jesus, he wept. He wept because he, he, he knew what had happened to man. And he knew what he had come to do. Look at what he has done. Paid. Someone paid. Blood had to be seen. Oh. Jesus gave his blood for you. Do you value his blood? If you value what he has done for you, you will do anything for him. Yeah. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 21, He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Those people who obey, this is easy uh, English, those people who, who obey my commands, are the ones who really love me. You love him, you obey his commands. He says, don't fornicate. I won't fornicate. You are fornicating because you don't understand his love for you. You have not come forth out of death because you don't understand his love for you. You understand his love for you? Fornication will be difficult. The girl's must also be big. His, her hips will be, her hips will be big. Her breasts will be very nice. But I, I love my Jesus. I, I love my Jesus. I love my Jesus. And because I love my Jesus, he says I should keep his commandments. Ah, he says if you love me, keep my commands. Those people who obey my commands are the ones who really love me. They accept my words and they will do what I say. My father will love everyone who loves me. I will also love them and I will show myself to them. So intimacy is at stake. That girl's bottoms is challenging my intimacy with God. That is what, is, that is what it is. Hey, I will lose... Intimacy with God for big, for, bo for big bottles or small bottles, yes, for small bottles, depends on which one you like. Small bottles, verse 23. Look at verse 23, John 14 23. 
Can you read it to me? One to go. If a man will love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love me, and he will come unto him in the beginning of our world. The one who loves me will keep my words. And when he, as he keeps my words, my father will love him. We'll make our headquarters with him. You, you carry the presence of God in another dimension. You'll be a headquarters of God. Yeah. You love me? Keep my words. John chapter 21, verse 15. Jesus told Simon Peter, Simon loves me more than all these things. If you love me, then feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Three times. You love me, you feed. I'm standing here because of my love for Jesus. Not because of what money. What is money? What is money? Money. No, he gives me more money than anybody can give me. Yeah. I feed his lambs because of my love for him. Nothing else. I can stand and preach for more. I can preach for 10 hours, 12 hours. That's my life. I can preach for morning. Camp meeting. I'm preaching. Yeah, no break. I'm going. If you like, it's fun. We'll be there. I can preach for six hours straight, seven hours straight. Go on a break and come back and continue. Why are we doing all of those things? Just because of our love for him. He says, if you love me, feed my sheep. So I feed the sheep. I'll do whatever I need to do to feed the sheep. That love group that you are handling, that you are not teaching what you are supposed to teach, you are playing with, it's a show that you don't love him. It's a show that you don't understand. And you don't love him because you don't understand how much he has loved you. Yes, you loved him because he first loved us. If you understood, you'd love the sheep. You'd feed the sheep. Because the sheep were, were purchased with his blood. With his precious blood. Nice. Take heed unto yourself and unto the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To feed the flock of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Yeah. You understand? Take it therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock of the which the Holy Ghost has been with us here. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. He purchased them with his blood. You were purchased by the blood of Jesus. I can't handle you anyhow. I can't be rude to you. I can't destroy your life. No. Yes. yes. Lift up your hands and just thank him. I see healings taking place right now. Yes. I see healings taking place right now. He paid for it. You have a right to healing. You have a right to healing. God has made you the heir of all things. Healing. Healing. Come forth into life. Living and walking in the righteousness of God which is by faith. Living in health, divine health. Receive your healing right now. I command every sickness to leave your body. I command that pain to leave your body. I command that sickness to go now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every demonic influence around your mind is leaving you now. Now you can, you can focus. I'm seeing someone you couldn't focus before. The Lord is changing that right now because he changed it on the cross of Calvary and it is happening now practically. Now you can stretch yourself with faith and receive. Take that healing, that freedom for yourself. You have a right to it. He paid for it. The Lord paid for it. He paid for it. He paid for that pain. He paid for that confusion. He paid for that family problem. There's a family problem that has been there for many years. The Lord has settled it on the cross. Today, From today onwards, that challenge, that family problem, that thing that has been a problem in that family, that it has caused a lot of confusion, is dissolved now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Ah, and I'm seeing the feet of men, men and women carrying the gospel. Your feet is shining with the preparation of the gospel. Yes, the Lord is making you his choicest servants. That's what the Lord is doing right now. Yes, he's done it already. It's happening practically in your life. He's making you his choicest servants. Choicest servants. Thousands are going to come because of you. 
because of your love for him because of your understanding of his love for you that's what is going to happen glory 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 she are ama ase epa ado o aka ata pelo pala ase ete maybe you are watching us online what is happening is happening there as well what is happening here is happening there as well it's happening with you the lord has touched you made a change in your life made a change in your life i'm seeing a snake that has been snapping the life out of you be snapping snapping the sniffing the life out of you that snake is leaving you now in the name of the lord jesus it's leaving you now 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 freedom has come 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 your freedom jesus came to announce liberty to the captives liberty has come receive your liberty now receive your liberty now receive your liberty now Receive your liberty now. Mano o she eka a pala dani. Sege de edo. Palo adana de eko sha adani. Liberty for you. 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 Ena asi eko ona ade ashe. Perigada. Seno ush a pari kidi adanaba. Elo obane isa a palo gede. Rege edama. I'm seeing a big stone that has been rolled on a pile of money. Yes, I'm seeing a lot of money, but there's been a stone that has been laid on that money. And it's, it's, it's related to a family. There's supposed to be prosperity in that family, but there's a stone that has been put on it. Yes, some, the devil has put a stone on it. A limit on you. It's like you can't, you can't use what God has brought to you. But the Lord has lifted that stone right now. That stone was lifted on Calvary. It is happening practically in your experience now. From now onwards, that prosperity, that poverty problem in your house has come to an end. You can serve God in prosperity. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Money is not going to be a problem for you anymore. I speak as a prophet of God. Money is not going to be a problem for you anymore. Money is not going to be a problem for you anymore. The Lord himself is walking in your finances. Yes, he's walking in your finances. Yes, every stone has been removed, taken away. Liberty has come. Glory has come. Glory has come. Glory has come. Can you celebrate Jesus for bringing glory into your life? Can you give Jesus a big shout? Hallelujah. I didn't say you should give me a big shout. I said you should give Jesus the one who purchased your salvation. And brought you righteous. Give him, give him, give him glory, 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 glory. Now that you're born again, get to us on WhatsApp 059 for our Christian literature designed to help you in this new life. Get full messages on YouTube at Bishop Isaac Oti Button. Let's get interactive. Bishop and Love Economy Church are everywhere. Scan this QR code or go to linktree forward slash Bishop Isaac to get access to all our social media handles. For prayers, counseling and inquiries, call 059 2222 695.